Turn to John chapter 9. We're going to be uh, in John 9 tonight looking at a story that is fairly familiar or, or will be to most of you. But I want to examine it tonight to show you really the depth and the breadth of God's Word, how we can take a book that we say we know and read it for a lifetime and still never completely tap all of the tremendous knowledge and lessons and applicability to life that is contained within it. The Gospel of John is one of the most beautiful Gospels that we have. I believe it's tied with the other three for most beautiful Gospel. Uh, and, and John is very clear because his, his primary audience is people that may not have been overly familiar with Jewish tradition, but he gives us a very clear reason why he wrote that gospel. Keep your finger in chapter 9 and flip over to John chapter 20. So this is probably one of the clearest explanations as to why a writer, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, pens these words, John chapter 20, and go all the way to the end of chapter 20 and look at verse 30. John says this, he says, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Okay, that makes sense, that, that you can't contain everything that Jesus did in, the, in the, the preceding chapters that we've read. And then look at what he says in verse 31. But these are written. What he has just written in this book, what we are going through in Sunday school, what we're going to be examining tonight, these are written. Why? that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Guys, this isn't just some academic endeavor that we are going through as we look at the book of John or any scripture. We read these things so that you know who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, and that believing on him, you might have eternal life. That is why we are here tonight. That is why we can be in a place, even in the midst of, of difficult circumstances, in, in, in the midst of trials, and still have joy. Because there is the promise of eternal life with God through Jesus Christ. Th that, is a, that is something that, that we need to, to be mature enough to rejoice about it. it's not that we don't mourn in the in the difficult times but we recognize that jesus as a sovereign king has come and that he has paid the price that he he, he paid my debt for my sin so that in believing on him i might have eternal life with him. You know, it's kind of a, an interesting thing when we say, you know, you believe on Jesus Christ, you'll have eternal life. Well, guess what? You're, everybody's going to live for eternity in one place or the other. We're either going to live for eternity in the presence of the Savior and his perfect, all-encompassing love, or we're going to live for eternity separated from that all-encompassing perfect love with God's wrath poured out on us. John writes the, the, this gospel so that people will believe. Now what's amazing is he says, you know, there's a lot more that, that I could have written. And he says that because John only records seven miracles. We're going to be looking at one of the miracles that John records in the gospel tonight. And, and it's in John chapter 9. So I want you to turn to John chapter 9 and we're going to be beginning in verse 1. And we may read the whole chapter. I don't know. We'll see. We probably will. John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when, he in, and when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with, his, with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Shalom, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and he came back seeing. I want you to see the, 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 how just very benign that statement is. 
Jesus made some clay, put it on his eyes, said, go stumble your way to that pool, wash yourself off, and then it just says, and the man came back seen. Okay, moving on. No big deal. Just an incredible miracle just took place. A man blind from birth meets, a, meets Jesus. Jesus puts clay on his eyes, tells him to go wash. He obeys, does it, comes back, and he can see. Look at verse 8. Therefore, the neighbors and those who uh, previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, No, he's, it's like him. He's like him. And he said, hey, it's me. I'm he. I'm the guy. Look at verse 10. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said, this, this makes a lot of sense. Then they said, where is he? Where is this guy that just did that? We want to we find this guy. And he said, I do not know. I lo- this is, does it, am, am I the only one just amazed by how common this conversation is? If you had a neighbor who you knew was blind from birth and all of a sudden a guy could see, would you just be carrying on a normal conversation with him? Hey, what happened? Oh, well, you know, I met this guy, and I can say, really? I wonder where that guy is. Don't know. All right, well, have a good day. (laughs) I love it. Now, look at verse 13. They brought him, who formerly was blind, that's how he's known now, to the Pharisees. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Uh Uh-oh. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Okay, or what, they're trying to defraud Social Security or something? You know, how how then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, by what, by, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. Thanks, thanks, mom and dad. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? (laughs) Then they reviled him. Yeah, they didn't like that. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, We do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to him, Why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it's been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you're teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? Guys, I want you to understand how profound that statement is. This man lost everything. He was tossed out of, he was basically excommunicated, tossed out of the synagogue, no longer part of the Jewish community. That is what they had promised they would do. That is what they did. And while he is out, Who comes and finds him? Jesus. 
Jesus cares enough, not just to heal him, but to come back. Jesus finds him. He answered, and, he, and Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. Man, that's good. That is so good. The, look, the entire ninth chapter of John talks about this man who receives sight through the miraculous healing of Jesus Christ. Jesus is just passing by. He sees a blind man who's blind from birth. The disciples are quick to do what Jewish people did in the ancient Near East and say, hey, why is this guy blind? It was, what sin did this guy do? Or if he was from, blind from birth, what did his parents do? Sounds like some churches I've been in. Yeah. Oh, what did that guy do? Oh, okay. But they're quick to ask, why is this guy in such a pitiable condition? Is it because of his sin, the sin of his parents? And Jesus answers that it's not the blind man's fault. It's not his parents' fault. But this man was blind from birth so that the work of God could be revealed in him. God, sovereign in every area, allowed this man to be born blind for this exact day that Jesus, passing by, would see him, speak to him, heal him, and then this man would be used to go and provide testimony to the religious leaders of who Jesus was. Guys, that is powerful stuff. That speaks to God's sovereignty. That speaks to his perfect plan, a plan that even we don't understand at times, but we must trust. Christ heals him. The man receives his sight. And all of this catches the attention of the Pharisees. All of it catches the attention of these guys who really liked being in charge. And they bring this healed blind man in and they interrogate him. And because of his testimony, because of his desire to speak the truth, he's excommunicated. He's tossed out. Jesus finds him. He becomes a follower of the Messiah. He recognizes Jesus, believes what Jesus has to say, and worships Jesus. Guys, he comes back with the only logical response that any man or woman can have when they are confronted with the real Jesus. Believe and worship. That is what happens. Now, I got to get moving because we have about 37 minutes to cover 12 things. You ready? <laughs> Feeling kind of optimistic tonight. Are we ready? Okay, there's 12 lessons. Here we go. Lesson number one. Straight out of verse 1, I want you to understand, Jesus notices the least of us. Jesus notices the least of us. I want you to understand, during the time of Christ, if you were born uh, blind, if you had any physical infirmity, if you were crippled, you were set apart from the family. You were set out to beg. And, and that is exactly what this man was doing. Most of them were left by their family, ended up begging for food or money in the street, and very often they would starve to death. Very often they would die. Very often, guys, if it was a child that suffered from too severe of an infirmity, that child was taken to the edge of town and left to die. They were seen as the lowest class of society. They didn't have wealth. They didn't have power. They didn't have anything that would cause anyone to look upon them with any amount of respect. And yet Jesus looks, and what does he see? He sees even in those who are infirm, those are the, that are hurting, those that are crippled, those that, that have any of these, these things that the world says no longer makes them normal, Jesus looks and says, you are an image bearer of the king. 
You're an image bearer of God. And because you are an image bearer of God, you have intrinsic value. You are a treasure. Jesus comes. And, and, and you know what? If, if, if I wrote this, Jesus would be noticing the rich guy or the really athletic guy or the popular guy. Those, were the, those would be the ones Jesus was noticing. But this is God's perfect plan. Who does Christ notice? Well, because he's different. He sees the least among us, and that includes this blind man. Look at what it says in verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Do you know how many people walked by this, this guy every single day and didn't see him? Pretended not to see him? Saw him as someone not worthy of even recognizing? This is more than just visible sight. Jesus saw the man. He saw his blindness. He saw his plight. He saw all that he was enduring. And it's because he took the time to look. I want you to understand something. Guys, Jesus manifests himself through us. He helps us see what he sees. If you wake up in the morning, that is one of the things you need to be asking God. God, well, I guess you did wake up this morning because you're here. Okay? God, help me to see what you see. Help me to love what you love. Help me to hate what you hate. Get me out of the way. Manifest yourself through me. Jesus passes by and he sees this man blind from birth. If you go back to chapter 8, do you know what Jesus was doing? Jesus was just fleeing from a mob who wanted to kill him. And now he's here passing by and sees a blind man, and he takes the time to notice this man. We have the assurance as born-again believers that no matter who we are, God still took notice of us. God still saw value in us. God still pursued us. And that should be an encouragement for anyone that has friends or family that, is not, that have not given their lives to Christ yet. God is pursuing them. Why? Because he loves them more than they can comprehend. And he desires that none should perish, but all come to a saving knowledge of the truth. We have that promise in his word. He notices even the least. We, we can have the comfort that God sees us. Everything that we're going through, everything that we endure, all of our anxieties, all of our worries, all of our hurts, God sees them. And Hebrews tells us not only does he see them, he understands them. He is our sympathetic high priest. That is the God that, that we have. He cares for us. He wants a close relationship with us. He's calling to us. And it's up to us to draw close. And he tells us, draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. You want God to be closer? You want to feel Him every day? Then draw close to Him through a study of His Word and through prayer. Draw close to God, and He promises He'll draw close to you. The very first thing that we see from, from this is that Jesus notices even the least among us. Number two, our weakness should lead us to God. Our weakness should lead us to God. Look at verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This, this man was blind from birth. We, we look at that in the world and say, you know what? You've got every reason to shake your fist at God. And so that's not fair. I wanted to be a model. <laughs> now, unless I got a job being the before guy all the time, there was no way I was going to be a model. Now, I could shake my fist and say, God, that's not fair. But God had other plans for me. God, God comes and, and wants us to understand that in our weakness, he is able to demonstrate his perfected strength. And, and what's amazing is the weaker we are, the stronger he is the stronger he is. The times that I have been closest to my God is when, uh, as a result of the consequences of my own sin, I could not get up off the floor. I, couldn't, I didn't have the strength 
to, to stop heaving sobs and get up off the floor. But that is when I felt God the closest. That is when and he, he came and, and in his perfect comfort brought me peace. But this man comes and he's got every reason, at least the world says, to be mad, to question God's goodness, to question his love. And yet what most people would think is a curse, this turns into a blessing in this man's life. When, when Jesus is asked by his disciples the reason why this man became blind, he says, so that the works of God should be revealed in him. This guy is going to be a testimony of God's goodness, a testimony of his faithfulness, a testimony of who God is. You know, if this guy hadn't been blind, most likely we wouldn't read about him at all. And now here we are thousands of years later and we're reading about this obscure blind guy who's healed by the Messiah. You know, there are those who are well and, and, and healthy, ones who don't, don't ever see a need for God. They, they have the good life already. Why would they need God? It's those who are weak and who are sick and who are in need of, uh, of God's just incredible grace poured out upon them. I will tell you, the, the great weakness of the church in the West is our prosperity. If we had to endure more tribulation, I bet we would be crying out to God a lot more. God comes and He turns trials into testimonies. He turns misery into ministry. He has the power to turn lemon into, into lemonade. He, he takes a man who is born blind... And, and, and allows him to obtain honor by being healed by the Messiah. The, this, the rest of his life, that is what that man was going to be known for. Jesus healed me. And you know what? By, by his own testimony, it looks like he was going to spend his life telling the world about it. This, this ailment that, that so many looked down upon was the same thing that led him to Christ. How, how can we apply that? It shows that even in the midst of trials, we can still find joy. We can still understand that we have a faithful, loving, gracious, merciful Savior. And that even when He doesn't answer the way that we want Him to, He tells us His grace is more than sufficient. There's nowhere in here, and believe me, I've looked, where God promises us a life free from trial. Man, sometimes I wish there was. Maybe it's in the NIV, I don't know. But, but he does tell me that regardless of all the trial, regardless of all of it, he's always going to be there. There's never going to be a time that I'm alone. There's never going to be a time he's not there. I never will walk alone. I, I may lose confidence, but God will always be there to see me through. My weaknesses need to drive me to God. Number three, we have to learn to endure hardships through God's grace. God's grace is the thing that allows us to endure hardship. Guys, this is not about trying harder. It is about surrendering to God's grace in your life. Because guess what? You are going to deal with things that you cannot handle. But he can. But he can. The Jews in Jesus' day lived under the illusion that every suffering was caused directly by a sin committed either by that person or that person's parents. And while it is most certainly true that sin does lead to suffering and it does lead to consequences and a lot of problems... There are times that we suffer not because of anything of our own doing. Jesus comes and he says, this was not this man's fault. It wasn't even the fault of his parents. But there's a purpose for why it happened. 
there's a reason. The fact is, is as long as we are living in a fallen world, we're going to experience hardship. We're going to face difficulties. It's sad to know that, that, uh, that it had been a great while that, that this blind man didn't know why he was born blind. He, he would have spent a life trying to figure out, boy, what did mom and dad do? Or what did I do? You know, it's interesting. I had a conversation with a lady just right before this phone conversation. And she asked me a question. It was kind of interesting because I've never been asked that question before. She said, do you believe that if a person is saved, once saved, they're always saved? And I said, oh, absolutely. And she said, ooh, that's a problem. <laughs> what? I said, that, that's a problem? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, because then, then you can't explain what happened to Judas. Well, sure I can. Judas was never saved. Judas tried really, really hard to look saved, and he deceived a lot of people. But you know what? He wasn't saved. And, and I tried to explain to her, I said, let me give you the number one reason that I believe that a person, once they're saved, is always saved. I said, because if it was possible for me to lose my salvation, I would. And so would you. And so would you. Everybody in here would. That's why it's not reliant on me. It's relying on a Savior who holds me in his hand and will not let go. Jesus even said, the ones that the Father gives me, no one can snatch away. No one can snatch out of my hand. That includes us. And yet this man would have been wondering, man, you know, everybody tells me it's some sort of sin. What did I do? What did my parents do? That would have caused me to be blind. I want you to understand something. This man was asking himself those questions at the exact time the light of the world walked by. This man who was sitting in darkness his entire life, all of his suffering, uh, sufferings were culminating to this day when he was going to have his sight restored. And the fr I want you to understand this. He goes and washes and he comes back seeing. And guess who he gets to see? Jesus the one who healed him. This, this is such a beautiful picture. All of these sufferings culminate into to having his sight restored and, and meeting the Messiah. What an honor this man had. And I've got to think, I don't know. Look, absolute speculation, that means it's eisegesis. Don't take it as fact. But I have got to think that on this man's deathbed, he would look back and say, you know what? I was blind for this many years. It was worth it. It was worth it. Because the years that I had after I met Jesus blew away the ones before. And I will tell you what, I can with great assurance preach that same testimony. That the years that I have had with Jesus are so much better than the ones before. All that pain, all that suffering, all that, uh, that darkness instantly gone for this blind man. And now all he wants to do is follow Jesus. You know, it, it, it's funny because the Apostle Peter said this in, in 1 Peter. He said, for what credit is it if, when you're beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it pa patiently, that's commendable before God. What he says is, what, what good is it if you get the consequences of your own stupid, sinful choices? You deserve those. But you know what's commendable? Is when you do good and suffer. You do good and suffer. When we endure sufferings that are not caused by us, God commends us for that. And I will tell you, there are many times that God puts more importance on how we develop character than our comfort. You know, whenever people come to me for marriage counseling, whether it's pre, in the middle of, hopefully not post, okay? But when they come, I give them a book. I give them a book, um, and it's called um, Sacred Marriage. And the entire premise of this book, Sacred Marriage, is God designed marriage to make you holy, not necessarily happy. Ooh, 
really? So God designed the... Now, are there moments of happiness in marriage? Absolutely. But the primary purpose of marriage in God's design is to conform you to the image of Christ. It's to make you more holy. That's tough. That, that's a tough lesson to learn. Because I will tell you, there are many wives in here who have endured sufferings not caused by themselves. God commends that. And there's probably a couple men in here too. But it's mostly wives, let's be honest. Okay? <laughs> and it's done, why? To help us develop godly character. And more often than not, if it comes down between the choice of God wanting me to be comfortable or to build my conformity to Jesus Christ, my comfort's going out the window. My comfort's going to go out the window. James says this in chapter 1, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I want you to understand something. Anytime you see that word perfect or complete in the New Testament especially, I want you to understand what it's referring to. It is almost always referring to Christ's likeness. When it talks about perfect patience, it's saying you're going to develop Christ-like patience. Whenever you see that word, that is the main reason why we endure trials so that we will be perfected and complete and conformed to the image of Christ. God is preparing us through tests, through trials, through lessons in life. That is the purpose of our existence. Now, I asked the 1010 so they don't get to answer this this morning, but why, did you, why do you think God saved you, Dave? There's two main reasons. Why do you, can you give me one? Too long, okay? There we go. God saved you. I'm just teasing, okay? God saved you, number one, so that he could conform you to the image of his son, to teach you, okay? That's what I was going to say. That was a great answer. <laughs> that was a great I forgot my gold stars or I would stick one right on your forehead, okay? Okay, so the first one is to teach you. What's the second reason? Okay? Okay? Keep coming. To use me. To use me. Okay? God taught me. Why? God teaches me, conforms me into the image of his son. Why? So that he can use me. To what? Go and tell the world about him. And in so doing that, I'm bringing him glory, and I'm worshiping him. I'm doing, him, I'm doing all of those things. But God saved me so that he could teach me, conform me to the image of his son, and then use me. Get to work. Go out there and tell the world about me. Why? Because God desires that none perish. And for whatever reason, in his grand plan, not wouldn't have been my call, but his is perfect, he chose you and me to be the ones to tell the world about him. Conform me to the image of your son and then send me. Fashion me, send me. That is what God does. There's no way we're going to get through all 12 of these. You people are not helping me. Okay? Number four. Number four. Okay? We have to follow God's commandments rather than man's traditions. When did Jesus heal this man? On the Sabbath. Okay? Did he do work on the Sabbath? Absolutely. Absolutely. He made clay. Okay? Now, I'll tell you what. The whole, why did Jesus spit into the mud and make clay why did he use this particular method to save the man theologians have tried to figure out this for years why do you suppose he did that is there some deep theological meaning to it say no no there's not there is not okay uh, i will tell you i don't have all the answers but here we go okay I, want, I, I really believe the number one reason or one of the reasons Jesus did it is because he, want, he didn't want people restricting him to one way of healing. Do you not think God could have come up to this man and said, oh, by the way, you can see now? Of course he could have. He could have been all dramatic, gone all Benny Hinn on the guy and throw him across the room and he could see. Okay? 
But he goes through this big, elaborate process. Spits, makes some clay, rubs it on there, sends him on his way. Okay? I, I believe the second reason uh, here is, is where Christ was really trying to make his point. The Jewish authorities over the years had created their own do's and don'ts about the Sabbath. What, did God, what was God's rule about the Sabbath? Keep it holy. You tell me how we get from keep it holy to you're not allowed to strain gnats out of your water on the Sabbath because that's work. Is that, a, is that a footnote? You know, was there a couple of extra tablets we missed in the back? No. Those are traditions of men. Jesus comes, and, and, and I really believe that because men had taken, and instead of calling the Sabbath a delight, a time of rest, they had turned it into a burden. Jesus comes and he heals this man on the Sabbath. Well, you know what? Work was prohibited on the Sabbath. So was healing. You couldn't do anything good on the Sabbath. You just couldn't do anything. And my guess is you can only twiddle so many times. <laughs> oh. oh. The commandment was important. All of the added traditions of men weren't. Jesus comes and, and he doesn't break the Sabbath command, but he most certainly destroys the tradition of men. And they were traditions of men that were contrary to what God had actually commanded. And I will tell you, for you and I, when it comes between choosing to follow what God says in His Word and the traditions of men, even within the church, we follow God's Word. God's Word has preeminence. You know, Jesus comes and He quotes the prophet Isaiah and He says, These people honor Me with their lips, but their heart is far from Me, and in vain they worship Me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Their hearts are far from me. We are to, to follow God's commands and guys to ignore the traditions of men when they are contrary to God's commands. Lesson number five, we have to do the work of God. We have to work the work of God. We see Jesus here. He is a man with a mission. He knows his purpose right from the start. He's got his priorities straight, and he is going to accomplish that goal without any doubt. Look at what he says in verses 4 and 5. I must work at the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work, and as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus comes and sets the example for us of doing God the Father's work. That was his purpose. His special diet was doing the work of God. And he made a special point of saying, doing it while it is day. I am to work. That means that while he still has the time, he is to be about God's business. What a lesson for you and I. We get so distracted with the craziness of this world that we forget about doing God's business. What is God's business? To tell the world about Him. We get so caught up in activity, even activity that seems good, activity within the church, activity within the community, that we set aside the work of God. Jesus comes and he, he demonstrates that he has this incredible sense of urgency. He understands that time is, is limited. He's not always going to have the opportunity to do his work. Guys, it's the same for us. The days are short. And you don't have to look far to see that the fields are ripe for harvest. I, I was having a talk with a guy, and you know, we're not going to get to all 12 points, sorry. Okay? 
you can, you can email me and ask me what the rest of them are. I was talking to a guy, and he said, you know what? Very encouraging, brother. He says, I used to think that we lived in a post-Christian time, that, that we came through post-modernism, and now we lived in a post-Christian world where Christianity just didn't, even, didn't matter to anybody anymore. He said, I don't think that anymore. He said, people are so ignorant of God's word and of Christianity, the doctrines of Christianity. He said, I believe that we live in a pre-Christian environment. Well, guess what? Guess who else lived in a pre-Christian environment? The entire church of Acts lived in a pre-Christian environment. And they were able to go to the world and tell people about a Jesus that they had never heard of. I'm telling you, that is how the world is now. It used to be that everybody at least had some idea who Jesus was. Guys, more and more people have never heard of him. They have no idea what church is. They have no idea who Jesus is. They have no idea their desperate need for a Savior. No idea. I believe we live in a pre-Christian time, and there was no better time in this world for the workers to go out and work the fields. Thank you for that enthusiastic response. I appreciate that. <laughs> kill me i i don't know what i expect sometimes i think i'm gonna say something and someone's gonna go let's go we're all gonna go running out the doors to walmart to witness to everybody okay thank you for for popping that balloon because uh i i don't think that's happening tonight you know well we could but we got popcorn right when this is done we don't want to miss that so all right all right, number six, you guys. We're going to get to half of them. How's that? Obedience and faith come together. Obedience and faith come together. Jesus most assuredly healed this man, but he did something very interesting. Jesus did the work, put the clay on his eyes, could have healed him right there, but what did he make him do? What did he do? Go wash your eyes off. Could he see yet? Do we know how far the brook was or the pool? Isn't that the blind guy that's always sitting by the gate? What does he have all over his face? So he stumbles off to the pool. We don't know how long it is, but we know that he obeyed. He did what Jesus said. Do you think this man was desperate? Man, he was, he was grasping for anything. He was grasping for anything. Jesus comes, puts this on, says, go, and the man obeys. Do you think he knew why? Nope. Nope. He just did it. He just obeyed. I used to, I, I used to joke uh, when I was in the military. We had a thing uh, where we were supposed to start letting the younger enlisted guys have more input. Okay. We, we were supposed to ask their opinion of things. Now, that kind of threw me off. I was kind of old school. And, you know, one of the things that we were called to do was, was form PAT teams, process action teams, to, to look at the way we did things. And I said, well, let me explain something to you guys. Okay, so when I was a commander, I, I told them this. I said, if there's time to do that, we'll do it. But if someone's shooting at us and I tell you to get your head down, that's not the time for you to go, well, can we talk about that, sir? <laughs> Same thing with this, with this guy. Jesus told him, I put this on your eyes, now go. And he got up and went. For you and I, whenever Jesus tells us something, I've got a little help for you. Do it. Do it. Do it without delay. Do it immediately. Do it with the right heart attitude. Do it even saying, Lord, I have no idea why I'm doing it, but you've called me to do it, so I'm going. And do it. Faith and obedience go together. As a matter of fact, faith is the door that swings on the hinges of obedience. Now make no mistake about it, Jesus is the one that does all the work in salvation. He does, he's the one that does all the work in healing. 
But our obedience grows our faith. And guys, when my faith grows, guess what I become? More conformed to the image of Christ. And when I become more conformed to the image of Christ, I am more usable for God's work. And I want to be usable for God's work. If I'm to have faith in Jesus, I have to couple that faith with obedience. Jesus comes and he gives this teaching moment. Okay? Because I want you to understand, Jesus doesn't just come. Let me ask you a question. What do you think the primary purpose of Christ coming and healing that man's vision? Was it making him so he could see? Nope. Nope. Jesus, in healing this man physically, sought to heal him spiritually. And the spiritual healing was far more important than the physical. Believing that this man believed what Jesus said. He believed in him. It was only later that he believed on him. And there's a difference. There's a difference. This man needed to grow spiritually and and i will tell you we live in a world today where where people christians love receiving the blessings of god but really aren't too keen on his lordship over our lives because i want you to understand that is the that is what undergirds obedience The thing that allows me to obey God, no matter what he calls me to do, is by recognizing his loving lordship over my life. He is in charge of every area. And because he's in charge of every area and loves me more than I can comprehend, I can easily do what he calls me to do. Guys, there is so much more in this. So much more how Jesus comes and, and uses this man as, as really the first missionary, not only to his neighbors, but, but, but once the man believes on him to go and tell the world about him. You and I have been blessed in, in a far greater way than even that man. I think sometimes we look at that and say, well, you know what? He, he was healed from blindness. That's so much better than anything I've ever gone through. If Jesus Christ has forgiven you of your sins, I want you to understand the incredible miracle that has been done in your life. And it supersedes any physical healing. The fact that your sins are forgiven, the fact that the judgment that should have been placed on you for your rebellion against God was placed on Jesus instead, The fact that that he has made possible for you to not only have forgiveness, but to have an eternal life as an adopted child of the Most High, where you will spend eternity with God. That is a miracle. That is real healing. That goes so far and above any, any physical healing that God could ever do. We are so blessed. So blessed. And I will tell you, uh, I think sometimes we just need to be reminded to get out of our pity party. Uh, America's not what it used to be. Oh, my retirement account. Oh, my third car is broken down. Oh, come on. My goodness, what a blessed people we are. What an amazing king we have. A sovereign who loves us. It's amazing. Guys, I want you to understand. This Savior that we sang, that that we want to exalt, that we want to praise, that we want to worship, He would be worthy of our worship even if He never forgave any sin. He's still sovereign. He's still God. He's still worthy of worship. But he goes so far and above. 
in giving us that, that precious gift of salvation, that precious gift of eternal life with him. What a blessed people we are.